This review was filmed during the 2023 WGA and SAG after strikes. Without the labor of the writers and actors currently on strike, the works being covered here wouldn't exist. I fully support the WGA and SAG after in their fight for fair treatment and compensation against a system that continually denies them such. While a full boycott has not been called for, SAG after has asked that everyone who does media about film and TV refrain from promoting struck content during this time. From what I can tell based on guidelines they have released, independent reviews do not constitute promotion of a work, but critical assessment of said work of art. Any praise that I give to these works during this video should be seen as praise purely for the artists, writers, and actors who created it. If anything, the praise is emphasizing that the writers, actors, and other artists deserve more compensation because they are who make these works possible. Additionally, this video was not made using any studio provided screeners or materials. Do not support any studios during the strike. I have to say, they did a lot of really great work bringing Star Wars Rebels animated stuff to live action in this series, but if they had screwed up this one important thing, I would have been out on the series completely. But thankfully, they nailed my boy Chopper and I couldn't be more happy! Hello interwebs, I hope you're all doing well because I am extremely excited to be reviewing another premiere of a Star Wars show, but one I have been very excited in anticipating, and that is the premiere of Star Wars Ahsoka. Before we get into it, just to let you know, I will be reviewing the first two episodes that premiered today as of this recording, and I'll keep the opening few minutes of this review fairly spoiler free, but I will go into full spoilers by the end of this review. And also, it should be said that there is going to be full spoilers for the series Star Wars Rebels. Not that I'll be getting into like all the nitty gritty of that show, but just sort of the general beats and especially the ending of that show, I will be talking about in this review if you have not seen it. Just because it's kind of necessary concerning that this show is very much a sequel to Star Wars Rebels. And with that being said, let's actually start there. I was very excited for this show considering that I was a big fan of Star Wars Rebels. It almost certainly was my favorite Star Wars TV series until, you know, Andor came along and also probably the later seasons of Clone Wars maybe edged it out a little bit after Rebels ended. And again, that show came out in weird order. Anywho, I uh, still really love Rebels. Uh, and so to learn that this series was going to be like a direct continuation of that show, I was like, holy uh, hell yes, I really want that, especially since we get Thrawn, we get Ahsoka, who's one of my favorite characters in all of Star Wars. You know, we get Ezra, we get my boy Chopper, Hera, my girl Sabine. Like, I was just very pumped on all of that. That being said, I was tempering my excitement with uh, a little bit of hesitation just because, you know, Star Wars live action TV series have been very hit or miss like Mandalorian and Book of Boba Fett. Eh. But then you get Andor, which is amazing. And since this was from part of the creative team, Dave Filoni that gave us Boba Fett and Mandalorian, though I also know Jon Favreau was a much bigger influence on those shows as well, it kind of had me nervous going into this series. And what I will say is that this show is definitely no Andor, but it is definitely low Mandalorian. I think this was a really solid two premiere episode it's one that had me very excited, not only as like a Rebels fan, because just seeing all the Rebels stuff on screen was like, oh my god, it's my boys and girls, and just the stuff, the stuff that I love, uh, in that sort of like nostalgic-y kind of way, but actually the story is really good in pushing the series forward, not just like looking at the past that Star Wars generally has kind of become to a degree. Like, this feels like an actual continuation of the story uh, in a way that I was very excited to see. I am curious to see how people who have not seen Rebels will take to this show, because I do think it does give you a good groundwork to kind of understand what's going on in the interactions with these characters, but it certainly has a lot more depth if you've seen Rebels. So I'm curious to see how much the show will hook people who haven't seen the show, but for me, I think it did a really great job of not just like utilizing the Rebels stuff, but actually making me feel like, yeah, there's a cool story that I can invest in that's going on here. And also, I haven't even said it yet, but my boy David Tennant as well. There's so many little, just my boys, so many of my boys. <laughs> The other two things that I actually really liked about this premiere as well was that the pace was a lot slower for Star Wars. Again, it's by no means Andor, which was a very deliberately paced show, especially in its first few episodes, uh, but even throughout the entirety of this series, it was definitely a more slower, more methodically paced show than the rest of Star Wars stuff, which I certainly vibe with. And Ahsoka is certainly faster paced than that, but it's also not like Mandalorian or the movies where just like things are moving, things are going, you don't really get a top, top to breathe. And I like that because it means everything we get feels weighty and meaningful. I think part of, not completely the problem, part of the problem with those other Star Wars shows is like it kept wanting to move you to the new next thing because it didn't have a lot of things it was thinking about. It just sort of like created and nonsense stuff to just keep the plot moving. Just give us more plot instead of thinking about what that plot's going to be. And here there's like just a pace that makes me feel like, oh yeah, we're dealing with these character arcs. We're dealing with this story. And I really kind of like the the weight and tension and build that it gives to the, the proceedings going on here. 
With that said, let's actually get into spoilers. I'm not gonna do my beat by beat review that I usually do for like Star Trek and Star Wars stuff just because there's two episodes here and then we'd be here forever. So I'm just gonna talk about the highlights and then as we get into reviews in future episodes of the series, I'll do a little bit more like in-depth analysis. Let's start off with Ray Stevenson. I know he just recently passed away, which is very unfortunate because he does a great job here as this sort of uh, Sith guy with an apprentice. And also, I'm very here for like badass, white haired, like Sith lady. Always, always here for stuff like that. That's very much my type. Anywho, uh, but Ray Stevenson, I think, gives a good gravitas to a character that could have come across fairly one note, but he does give a sense of personality. And so while the character himself is not super interesting to me yet, though I am curious about the mystery behind him, he is given more weight and personality by Ray Stevenson. So uh, very tragic to see that he is uh, lost before the show came out because he, he deserved all the accolades uh, for, for his performance because it's really great. Also, I forgot to mention, there's the uh, opening credits crawl, and I liked this a lot because it felt very Star Wars-ian, you know, with an opening credits crawl, but it was like flat on the screen, so it kind of had this like different kind of vibe to it. It was just like a cool middle ground uh, that I really enjoyed, and I also like the use of the term sinister agents calling back to A New Hope there. It was a nice little subtle thing. Next, we have Ahsoka looking for a map, which it feels like a very Star Wars-y type of MacGuffin, which I'm glad seems like it'll be mostly used up by the end of episode two uh, going forward, considering that we've seen what it's used for. Uh, but for this ep these episodes, it kind of gets the plot in motion in a decent enough way for me. Uh, but what I do really love is the back and forth between Ahsoka and Huang, played by David Tennant. Like, the two of them are great. And, and just Hu Yang with everybody is wonderful, like him with Sabine later on in episode two, where he's just very honest honest with her or his sort of like a very uh, methodical approach to everything and how that sort of bumps up against the sort of more rebelliousness of uh, both Sabina and even Ahsoka to a degree because Ahsoka herself pushed against the Jedi protocol. I thought it was, uh, it was just a nice sort of like uh, personality type to bring into this series, especially again, my boy David Tennant. We stand David Tennant very hard here. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I just, I really loved his presence and thought he was wonderful all the way throughout. And I really like the setup for him having a mini arc in the series about like he's stuck to Jedi protocol and he'll have to sort of maybe push beyond that as the series goes on. So like, like a nice little setup for a mini arc for him. And then we head over to Lothal and it was really cool to see the stuff that I had been only seeing in animation for years actually be brought to, you know, live action. It looked fantastic. Uh, I, I thought they did a really great job with this. It was nice to see Clancy Brown as the, you know, governor or whatever uh, of Lothal. Uh, and then Sabine being a little shit and being like, I don't know, I'm not gonna show up at your damn ceremony, being very uh, rebellious as is her nature. And I love the like punk Star Wars music that played as she was escaping the city. Uh, I, I, I adored that uh, quite a lot. Um, um, and then I liked her sort of getting to see the uh, live action Ezra Bridger uh, holocron. Again, uh, a lot for us Rebels fans there with him sort of giving a last message to Sabine to make her understand why he had to go off with Thrawn to sort of end the fight on Lothal and free Lothal. Um, but it also seems like a nice like reminder or pick up for people who e either forgot Rebels or hadn't seen Rebels. Um, so I, I thought it worked well at an emotional level, but also a, a, a exposition level as well. And it was cool to see live action Ezra uh, for all of this. We also got Mary Elizabeth Winstead as Hera, um, who was probably the weakest for me in terms of translating the animated characters to live action. I don't think she's bad by any means, but she doesn't like stand out with, with as much personality as Hera did, um, just in my mind. Uh, maybe your your mileage may vary, but to me, she just felt like she was fine as Hera, but didn't knock her out of the park. But Chopper was phenomenal, especially in episode two, where they have the little getaway and he's like tossing stuff out of the ship and everything, trying to throw the uh, tracker onto the other ship. Like just Chopper was wonderful in all of this. And I love that it eventually brings us uh, to uh, Ahsoka and Sabine meeting up and we get the sense of history between the two of them, even beyond what we saw in Rebels that they became, you know, apprentice and master and, you know, Sabine sort of balked against that. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Ahsoka doesn't really, they don't really trust each other and you get that sense of history in their words, but there's still a sense of respect between the two of them. And I also really like that Sabine, again, rebellious, steals the map, but then figures out the map using her, you know, artistic skills. You know, I, I love that idea that she is just, she's an artist for and that brain uh, of being an artist, you know, the, how she thinks is, is a unique one that sort of opens her perspective to things that others don't. Like I thought that was well portrayed even in these first few episodes to bring people up on who Sabine is. But this obviously leads to Sabine getting attacked uh, and uh, the map getting stolen. So we have our MacGuffin taken again and our Sith people taking it, which brings us to episode two, where we get uh, Morgan uh, sort of is using the map to sort of say that Thrawn is in another galaxy. And I'm very curious to see where 
that's going to be ahead of it. It's just going to be, we're going to go to that galaxy and bring Thrawn back, and that's about it. Uh, or if they're going to tie it into some other sort of forces, like, I, I mean, my, my brain instantly goes to something like the Yuuzhan Vong, because uh, I'm a big Expanded Universe fan, but I'm sure there's something, or rather from Star Wars, you know, a lore that I'm forgetting that someone will remind me of in the comments. Please do. Uh, but I'm like, ooh, you, outside the galaxy, Yuuzhan Vong? Is that what we're going for? Um, I'd be very curious to see where that ultimately leads. Uh, I also have to say, Morgan is interesting to me. She's fairly like, I am an evil lady uh, in these uh, scenes that we get here. But I also really love the Dathomir uh, witches. Uh, I, I do really enjoy them a lot. They're one of my favorite parts of Star Wars uh, in terms of like the expanded stuff that we get to see in animated shows and video games. Uh, so to see, you know, one in live action is, is really cool to me. Uh, so excited to see where they go with her. Hopefully she moves beyond being kind of a rote villain. And I like that she she's not against uh, the Sith guys that work for her, uh, but there's a little bit of tension between the two of them. I also really like this going to the Corellia shipyards, uh, where we get to meet the guy from House. It was one of the doctors from House running that shipyard, which I thought was fun. And uh, this sort of discussion around like capitalism and empire, how, you know, this guy is a capitalist businessman and he's still loyal to uh, the empire, I thought was uh, fascinating in terms of its political discussion. Because he sort of plays it as like, yeah, we're apolitical here. We don't really have any loyalty to anything. Like, don't worry about it. Don't worry about my classified stuff that I'm helping other people on the side. And I'm like, I literally like wrote in my notes, I'm like, all right, you're going to argue that capitalism is apolitical and they won't go with the people with the most money. Uh, bullshit. Especially the side that like, you know, imperial stuff like fascistic societies will ultimately, you know, benefit from capitalism and vice versa because they kind of dovetail nicely together. So capital will generally side with the more authoritarian side. Again, generally, not always the case. So it's sort of like, what is this show getting at? I do like it shows that they are on the side of the empire uh, and do get arrested at the end. So it was, it was a very basic sort of political discussion around capitalism and fascism and, you know, all that stuff. But it was, it was interesting to see in the show. And I like learning some stuff about like how the Republic is getting money uh, by selling old Empire stuff and the discussion like Republics don't become, uh, Empires don't become Republics overnight and there's still infrastructure that needs to be shifted. Like all of that stuff was interesting to me. Um, I think the only thing that like if I was had to put on my like critical brain on, uh, I would actually be curious to hear from Jewish folks about what they think about having the businessman guy who leads, uh, you know, who still works for the Empire be played by a very prominent Jewish actor. Uh, it's one of those, like, it's not for me to say, but I'd be curious to hear if there's any people who, who have thoughts on that. Because I could see that being just a really insensitive casting choice in terms of where they placed a Jewish actor in that in that position. Um, but again, I might be overreading it. And then we get some cool lightsaber fights, which I thought was fun. Chopper, my boy, doing his best. Uh, and then this all leads to, you know, Sabine rejoining with Ahsoka and recreating the last scene of Rebels, too, which was cool to see in live action. Uh, and them going off to try to stop Morgan, to stop and find Thrawn, and also find Ezra, potentially. So, loved all of this setup. Like, this, these two episodes very much set, felt like the setup for the larger story that this series is going to be telling. And then, ultimately, I know they said that there's going to be a movie that sort of spins out from this, so I'm, I'm hopeful that this series will feel like there's a sense of conclusion and not just like set up for a movie um but i am very excited to see where this goes because this has me set up in a very excited place going forward uh it was no andor but it by no means was a mandalorian either this was a solid start and had me very excited overall so those are my thoughts on the premiere of Star Wars Ahsoka Part 1 and Part 2. What did you all think? I'd love to hear all your thoughts down below. And yeah, I'll see you next week for the next episode, and I believe in two weeks for Star Trek Lower Decks, which I'm also very, very, very pumped about. Uh, so until then, I hope you all live long and prosper.